Thank you very much, everybody, and apologies for the shift into English. You, you really wouldn't want to hear me trying to speak German. And thank you for staying, um, despite the amazing evening outside and the heat. Um, so hopefully I won't um, send you to sleep um, by talk of our brave new world of decentralized communication in Matrix. Now, if anybody wants to interrupt at any point and tell me to slow down, speak higher, speak with a more normal accent, or just ask what I'm talking about, then please just stop me at any point and throw anything into the mix. Um, is it okay at the moment? Can everybody understand me? Yeah. Awesome. So Matrix is um, an open source um, project. Uh, we're organized as a uh, not-for-profit um, um, initiative going and creating uh, basically a whole new ecosystem for com interoperable communication on the net. And the problem we're trying to solve is to make voice over IP and instant messaging and really any kind of communication as easy as email. Because email sucks in so very, very many ways. And uh, you know, it's got spam, you've got weird mail clients, um, people can spoof anybody's identity, it's a mess. But at least if I want to send somebody an email, I don't care what server you use, I don't care what client you use. I can use whatever client I want, I can use whatever service provider it wants, and it will be able to get through to you eventually. Why do we still not have this on VoIP and instant messaging? I mean, f if you look um, over the years, there are obviously things like SIP, which I hear SIPgate knows something about, which have tried to solve this problem, but in practice have never really taken off the way that email took off. You've got XMPP and Jabber, which have tried to do the same thing as um, email, but for instant messaging. But you know, how many people here have got a active, openly federated Jabber account that they're using? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. How many people have an email address? You know, uh, uh, th this may be a self-selecting audience um, who are more likely to know what Jabber is, and perhaps some of you even have XMPP Jabber IDs on your business cards. But still, it hasn't got anything like the um, expanse and the reach that email does. So this is basically what Matrix is all about. Come on, laptop, you can wake up. Ah, come back to life. Oh, there we go. So the problem that we see is basically um, that users nowadays, if they want to do modern communication, so if they want to mix together their voice and their video, their stickers, their emoji, and whatever other cool things the young kids are using today, uh, they're stuck in proprietary communication apps. They just don't have any control over their data or their privacy. And in fact, they don't even select necessarily the apps that they want to use. They're basically peer pressured into installing Viber or WhatsApp or Kick or Facebook or whatever their mates at school or wherever want to talk to them using. So we're still, each of these apps is closed. Almost none of them interoperate at all. So as an end user, I'm sure we all have five, six, 10, 20, almost identical messaging apps installed. Some of them it's deliberate because we don't want our Tinder accounts getting mixed up with our LinkedIn accounts and that sort of thing. But um, in practice, if you look at, I know, Kick and Viber and WhatsApp and um, Line and WeChat, they all do very similar things, albeit for slightly different demographics of people who happen to have gravitated towards it. And personally, it's really frustrating that both my contacts and my conversations end up being fragmented between I don't know, Chinese people using WeChat, or everybody else using WhatsApp, or Facebook, or whatever it might happen to be. And relative to email, it's a joke. I mean, the entire internet was founded on the basis of interoperability. That's the cool thing about it. That's why we're basically sitting here today to talk about this sort of thing, that people said, hey, why don't we actually play nice for a change and provide a universal data transport, and oh, we can actually put universal application protocols on top. Nowadays, the greed has set in, and people want to lock folks into their specific communities in order to build the size of those communities to increase their valuation and get bought, by twin, uh, bought for $20 billion. And you know, economically, you can see why people do this, but it's very much at the expense of us as end users. So the classic problem, and apologies to folks from Setgate who saw this earlier today, um, but this is our kind of mantra image of the problem that Bob and Alice, our classic protagonists, face today, in that 
Bob wants to talk to Alice, so he wants to video call her. Well, he's got the options of Skype or Facebook, Hangouts, FaceTime, WhatsApp, Viber, and once he picks one of those, he's got to know the correct ID. Is it a Skype ID or a Facebook account? Perhaps it's just an email address or phone number. He's got all of these different options. There's twisty maze of passages all alike. Superficially, you might think he could pick um, any of them, and it's great choice. Hey, yeah, look at all these options. But in practice, it's a usability nightmare because he doesn't know which to pick. He ends up with them all installed. Can he remember which one Alice wants to use? Can he remember where that conversation was? It's a mess. So our thesis is that I want to communicate with the apps and the services that I trust and that I actually selected and I want to use. I do not want to be forced into specific services chosen by whoever I happen to be speaking to. And if email can do this, why on earth can't we do it with VoIP and Insta messaging? Enter Matrix, our humble suggestion as a solution to all of this mess. So Matrix, from a geek perspective, is, <laughs> is an open, decentralized, persistent, eventually consistent, cryptographically secure messaging database with a JSON over HTTP API. Now, this is jumping straight into the hardcore sort of tech adjective thing, and I apologize if you look at this and think, oh, buzzword, buzzword, buzzword. It's not buzzwords, as in we actually mean this one by one. So on the open side, the idea is that anybody on the net can run a Matrix server just like in, they can run a web server or an email server, or for that matter, a SIP or a XMPP server. So we've got Open Federation. It's an open standard that is defining how to do this interoperability. We're providing open source reference implementations as Apache license to show that we're not just doing vaporware, and this is a real thing, and you can use it today. And you basically can't get something more open. And literally, all of our IP of everything we're doing in Matrix is on GitHub in the public domain. Decentralized is a huge thing of what we're doing. In, the, in typical, say, Jabber, if I go into a multi-user chat with somebody, um, that chat room exists on a single logical server. There is a Jabber ID that describes the muck, and if that server goes down, that's it. Game over. You lose all the state, you lose the membership, you lose the history, if there was even history, and that's putting a lot of control in whoever hosts that chat room. And if they started off on some crappy virtual server somewhere, and you end up with 20,000 people in the room, again, you know, what are you going to do? It's a mess. So in Matrix, everything is decentralized. Persistency. Everything is persisted. So our first class um, citizen in Matrix is conversation history. You don't send somebody a message in Matrix. You go and say, I want to synchronize my chunk of conversation from my server to yours. Completely different mentality to SIP or XMPP, where it's all basically a message passing thing. Instead, this is very much basically a database problem of synchronizing data structures between servers. And the way we do that is with eventual consistency. Because the whole thing is decentralized and there is no one true matrix server for anything, really, um, you have this problem very similar to, say, Git, where you've got um, in Git a bunch of source um, files constructed as a acyclic graph data structure that you're synchronizing, pushing and pulling between repositories. Matrix is precisely the same thing. You go and build up the history of your room as this directed acyclic um, graph data structure, and you try to keep it in sync between everybody who's participating in a room with eventual consistency. This is insanely cool because it means you kill net splits for free. If I know I'm talking to Alice and her server happens to go offline for a bit, then Alice and everybody on her server can keep chatting away to one another quite happily, and when her connectivity comes back, it will just go and merge in with the history of what was happening elsewhere in Matrix. So you get offline, uh, offline operation for free, you get um, robustness to net splits for free. If you are going and sharing all of your history all over the world with anybody who participates in a given room, then cryptography is key. You don't want people randomly inventing history, you don't want them randomly censoring history, and you certainly don't want them reading all of your messages just because they happen to have the room at some point and then they have it for posterity and hand it over to the next person who has root on their box. So we want to encrypt everything end-to-end -end where people want it. And then finally, well, in the end, it's basically just a JSON database. You can use it for instant messaging or VoIP or really any type of data you can express as JSON. And we do this with really simple HTTP APIs because, hey, everything's got an HTTP stack in it these days, so why bother with a SIP stack or an XMPP stack when in practice HTTP is already there and basically does the, uh, the job for you. So the use cases we're focused on for Matrix are group chat, 
one-to-one -one is a subset of group chat. There is no direct peer-to-peer -peer messaging or one-to-one -one messaging in Matrix. Instead, you create a room and you have two people in it, then you've got a one-to-one -one conversation. But there is no special casing at all for a kind of private message like an IRC or a plain um, XMPP chat in XMPP. Second use case is WebRTC signaling, and I'm sure that many folks here are familiar with WebRTC, the call set that allows you to put a VoIP stack into every almost browser. The problem with WebRTC is that it has no standard interoperability profile um, for signaling at all. And this is a cool thing because it means that people can pick the right one for the job, but it's also a pain in the ass because you can't um, federate reliably between anything. There is no standard signaling at all. And there's certainly no um, federated HTTP API for doing it, which is the gap the matrix tries to fill there. Finally, just bridging communication silos of any kind. So if I've got Slack, and I've got Link, and I've got a Jabba server, and I've got an IRCD, the matrix is the perfect glue to go and matrix them together, if you will. And then finally, Internet of Things data. If you think the fragmentation problem is bad between messaging apps, you go and throw in all of WebRTC as well, so every website on the net has suddenly sprouted its own silo, which has locked your communications into it. And then you start wearing silly wearable devices from Garmin or Fitbit or, heaven forbid, Apple. And they, in turn, have no interest whatsoever in sharing their data between their silos. The fragmentation problem is getting worse and worse and worse. We need some kind of fabric in which we can exchange that data. So basically, you can use it for exchanging any PubSub data that you want to persist and exchange with the world. You can think of it, the matrix was built to liberate your scroll back, if you think in those kind of terms. Basically avoids any single vendor, any single entity going and stealing your conversations, mining them for data, and selling you crappy ads for the rest of your life. First law that we have is that conversation history and group, group comms are absolute key. It's all about synchronizing history, and everything is group. Second law, nobody, no single person owns your conversations. If I'm talking to somebody on a different server, then we are peers. I should have as much of the history of the conversation as I want. They should have as much as they want. It's not that you know, we, are, we are equals. There is no particular vendor who is in charge. And the final one, which is relatively new and almost true, is that all conversations may be end-to-end -end encrypted. So basically, the deal with this talk is that the first half, I tell you what Matrix is. Second half, I tell you about how we're doing the crypto, which is all new and cool stuff. But basically, it's critical that we get this right, and we're really excited about the stuff we've done with it. So I will explain it in a few. So quick overview of um, just Matrix in general. As I said, we're a nonprofit open source project. We define three HTTP APIs. We've got the client to server one, which is a really, really simple one, which allows you to send a blob of JSON and receive a blob of JSON, basically. You've got the server to server one, which is a lot more exciting because it does all the eventual consistency of Voodoo to keep the servers in sync with one another. And then you've got the application services API, which is um, the coolest one because it's where you go and extend matrix. If you want to do business logic and you want to build an IRC bridge or an XMPB gateway or a SIP gateway, heaven forbid, this is where you go and define the application service um, and plug it in to matrix. So that's on the spec side of things. And we publish these as an RFC style document, which is getting increasingly less sucky over time. It's not perfect, but it's increasingly comp complete and comprehensive, which is up on the website. Meanwhile, we also provide open source reference implementations for everything because we want to dog food it and show that it all works. So on the server side, we've got an Apache licensed and Python and Twisted project called Synapse. Uh, and we have client SDKs on iOS, Android, JavaScript, Angular, Python, Perl, and a whole bunch of third-party ones, which includes highlights like, um, I think, New Lisp and Erlang and all the languages which we didn't know how to write SDKs in. Um, on the client side, we have actual apps running on the web, iOS and Android. They're very ugly, they're very functional, but they show that the whole thing works. And then you have the whole fleet of application services. We've got some, our IRC bridge, which on matrix.org bridges all of Freenode into Matrix, and it was really kind that the Freenode guys gave us sufficient privileges to go and jack into Freenode at that level and expose the whole network into Matrix. Um, we've got a couple of SIP prototypes. Um, an XMPP one needs to be written real soon now, and there's a link one using Lead Purple, which is being built as well. So basically, it's the whole enchilada. It's a complete ecosystem of clients and servers and services and a spec. So what does this look like? Enough talking. Let's see if I can do a demo. These never go wrong. 
So what I'm going to show you is a draft of a Wikipedia page about Matrix. And moreover, this, which is, let me get on my Android tethering thing. So this is the Angular um, web client. <laughs> Absolutely inevitable, isn't it? Let me try again. Oh, my Wi-Fi's crashed. Moral of the story is to buy a new laptop. If anybody else is using a 17-inch MacBook Pro, I think it stays a long gone, unfortunately. Uh, let, yeah, my access point has died. Let me do it on the... Oh, actually, can I just use the Lean Deuce one? What's the password? Thank you. Okay, sorry for this. Hopefully that will work. Yeah, looks a bit more promising. So actually here we have an amazing example of offline mode in the Angular web client. Where there was a big red bar along the top. However, in this implementation, the entire client actually works um, offline using HTML5 local storage for all of the state. And the way to look at this thing is that you've got on the left-hand side a whole bunch of different rooms. I've got about 300 here. Some of them are one-to-one, -one, some of them are group. This one here is hash matrix on matrix.org. And the way in which we refer to these rooms are by these weird aliases, which look a bit like an IRC channel, except they're scoped to a domain. And that's the domain where the room was created. It's not where it lives, because in practice, we've got about 1,000 people in this room and about 150 different servers. So if you find somebody uh, like, um, who's on their own server? Like Eric here. Eric runs his own server. And his matrix ID, and in matrix you get internal matrix IDs, which look a bit like Twitter handles, so at Eric J on a domain, colon jki.re, which is his personal domain. He's running a server, so he has a whole copy of this room on his server, and he owns it just as much as the version on matrix.org. And in fact, we could join it by going to hash matrix on jki.re because he choose, uh, chose to advertise it there. But basically, um, you've got this huge room, loads of people in it, about 150 different servers actually are federating this room in different places. Some of them are even turned on. And um, if we double click on anything like that, like um, everybody panicking about me linking to XKCD without um, attributing it, if I go and double click on one of these messages, like so, it will <laughs> open up XKCD. <laughs> Who the funk it? Um, <laughs> Let me try one more. Ah, there we go. So that's the, um, what you should see. That you can see the underlying JSON of anything. So we use this for debugging. We call it the matrix console. And if I zoom in a bit, then you might be able to see better. That basically, the content of that text message um, was, well, the URL. It was formatted up as text. And the type of the JSON is a matrix room message, um, which is a Java-style data type to describe the kind of schema of that data. But it's completely extensible. You could have put any JSON you like in as the content, and you could have made up any type here that you liked, like, I don't know, com dot, or sorry, de dot, subgate dot, whatever it might happen to be. Um, well, let's look at something a bit more interesting, except I'm zoomed in so much it's all gone a bit skew. If, if we look at, say, the image, then it's a bit more of a complicated ob uh, object, and then we've got a mime type, we've got a width and a height and a size. Um, we've also got a URL for the image itself, which is a bit more exciting because it's this MXC URI structure. Actually, this is because Matrix gives you a distributed file system because it's all very well having chat rooms like this where the history is replicated everywhere, but if your attachments end up stuck on the server that where they were posted, it's, it's not very decentralized. So MXC basically copies the images or the content between whichever the participating servers are. So, I mean, these are the basic building blocks here. If we do a bit more of an interesting demo, let me see if I can call um, Kai sitting there in front. So I'm going to quickly go and find, uh, hopefully, my chat with him somewhere, except, oh, there we are. No, oh, yep, there's, well, there he is saying hi, Dusseldorf. Um, hello. Let's see how bad the connectivity is. Oh, that took ages to send. Oh, it's going to be great. So you might have noticed we've got these two buttons up here. These go and hook into WebRTC, and in a one-to-one -one room at least, oh, there we go, hi, um, mean that you should be able to click that button right there. Oh, and <laughs> go and get a WebRTC call happening. There we go, perfect. Yay. That's actually a pretty fast setup there. Um, I'll go and wave back at you, gormously. Thanks. Sorry for demoing against you. 
And so, yeah, uh, so you probably wondered what was going on there. Well, if we double click on the outgoing call, we can see. And it's really ugly, I'm afraid. Anybody who knows SIP or WebRTC, though, will probably find it quite familiar. But what we did was to have in our content um, JSON um, the age of the message, 60 seconds. The fact it's an offer of the media describing the call, then you've got this horrible, ugly description, which is taken straight from WebRTC, describing the STP of the media of the call, and the actual data type is an M call invite. So to set up a VoIP call in Matrix, it's two HTTP hits. One to go and send the offer that you take from WebRTC, one to respond with the answer that the other guy gets from WebRTC, and that's it. Nothing more. No more SIP, no more XMPP, no more jingle, heaven forbid. It's just really simple stuff that you can pull straight out of the um, network inspector in Chrome or Firefox and go and um, um, yeah, basically put into curl or put into whatever your language is and do a really simple VoIP stack. So that's an example of instant messaging, images, WebRTC over matrix um, as a Encore, let me see if I can show you the iOS app running, just to show that it's not just this web app. In fact, whilst I get this thing on the right network, um, and a good thing that is interesting to do is to go and look at matrix.org, uh, try matrix now. That wasn't that funny. Um, which lives about there. And this lists all of the clients which we know about at uh, any given point in any of the servers. So we provide free clients from the core team on the web, iOS and Android. The Angular thing is being replaced by React right now, and the React app is infinitely better than the Angular one. Um, I'll talk about, a bit about that in the future. All the others here have been done by third parties. So you've got a WeChat plugin, which is really cool for folks who like the command line side of things. I can probably quickly um, shell into my home account and pull up a WeChat. Oh, there we go. So uh, there's Escape Rat saying, hi, uh, UTF-8 escaping bug on my um, home PC, Dusseldorf. Um, but, you know, same stuff in there. Uh, what else have we got? We've got a Perl command line client using curses. We've got Glowing Bear, which is the web front end to WeChat. There's one written in Kotlin called Unplug, which I haven't played with yet, but it looks pretty cool in that it's an actual native app um, written on a JVM using uh, JavaFX. Uh, what else have we got? Red Pill, which is a Python one using curses. There's Headjack, that Kai in front is working on at the moment. Somebody went and turned their blog into being matrix powered because obviously this isn't just about messaging. You can use it for blog posts or email gateways or whatever. On the server side, we've got Synapse, and we also have two third party servers, Pallium and JSynapse, both of which are pretty immature um, because I guess they realized that it was very much a moving target, but at least they started them. <laughs> On the application services tied, we've got IRC, we've got SMS, we've got SIP from Metaswitch, we've got um, a general node SDK for doing these things, and a whole bunch of other third-party ones. And finally, the whole SDKs I mentioned earlier. So I should have been putting this phone on the network while saying all of that, but I forgot. So one second, whilst I finish. Let's see if I can mirror this up onto the screen so you can see it. I guess it depends on whether your firewall allows me to um, mirror, but let's see. Come on. Yes, it does. Good. Almost. Oh, that's interesting. So I can't see me, but I can see another device somewhere on the network. <laughs> what will happen if I try to mirror onto Apple TV UX3? <laughs> that's, mm, that's probably not so useful, then. Um, let me... I'll just restart Reflector here and hope that it does pick me up. Interesting that it would allow me to go to that, but not to here. Nah, oh well. It would have been better if I was tethered against my access point. But um, you'll just have to look close. That um, The Matrix iOS app is very similar to the Angular one. It's all completely in sync here. So if I quickly go back to um, uh, this conversation with um, Kyver and say, I oh know. Um, hello from iOS, then you should get hello from iOS coming up there because it's all multi-device um, based. You get push notifications for free on APNS and GCM. Uh, yes, uh, and so I just got that coming in on his Android watch. Um, if he responded, I'll get it coming in on my Apple watch as an APNS notification, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, 
and you can even try, even try to do video um, calling using a WebRTC stack on the handset. So let me s risk trying to demo that. Um, I was going to try to demonstrate WebRTC um, from the mobile just because. So I've got, um, we've got Evil Matthew who's wearing a suit here and normal Matthew above. I think this is logged in as Evil Matthew. But if I go and again hit the video call button here and pray, then... Hello. Oh, there we go. You get a video call coming in here. And uh, let's see what the networking is like here. Oh, come on. I bet I'm tethered now against the Android thing or something. Oh, it's really cool when it works. But basically, it's talking, um, <laughs> it's talking HT64 um, and hardware on this. And it's going through to the HT64 that Cisco went and contributed. Yeah, it's interesting. That it's, it's the same network. Oh, I don't know why that fell. Oh, I, I bet I do know why that fell. Never mind. Basically, it's experimental, and it's cool when it works. But honestly, it doesn't do it much um, at the moment. And we're working with Ericsson, who contributed the VoIP on iOS um, to try to fix some of the um, cool setup problems which we occasionally have. Let's, um, whilst I'm here, look in a bit more detail about how it actually works. And the best example we have of the underlying tech is on matrix.org itself, where at the bottom of the page, you get this little animation that shows three servers for Alice, Bob, and Charlie.com, each of which have one user each, Alice and Bob and Charlie, respectively, all of whom are in the same room. So what happens if Alice wants to send a message into that room? Well, she does a post with hello, and type of message is text, to a URL on her server. This gets um, signed and persisted into the server, and so you start to build up a data structure of that room there. Then um, that server goes and pushes it out to the other participants, and it uses the server-to-server -server API, which is a lot more comprehensive. Critically, we've signed the message here with an elliptic curve signature to prove that it came from Alice's server, at least. Then gets stored in those servers and relayed out to the clients. So far, so good. We've sent a message. It's amazing. If Bob responds, then that message gets built into the data structure with a pointer to the previous message as seen by Bob's server. And say that Charlie races with that. Charlie responds at the same time also saying hi. Then we have an interesting situation that we've got complete some inconsistency between Charlie with one and three, Bob with one and two, and just Alice with one. But the lovely thing in Mark Matrix is that it's a big, eventually consistent database. So this really isn't a big problem. Because all that is going to happen is that as Bob pushes his message out, it goes and splits the timeline on Charlie's server, because both two and three thought they came immediately after one. And meanwhile, when Charlie's message gets pushed out, the same thing happens on these guys. So in fact, we're now completely consistent. The fact that these thing, ones reckon it was ordered two and three, and this one reckons it's three and two, doesn't matter, because who knows what the order was? It was a race. You know, it's a Galilei relativity problem, or even a special relativity problem, to try to decide the ordering of um, those messages. So it really, really doesn't matter. And then later on, if Alice says something else, she'll just point back to the two dangling nodes in the graph, and you've gone and formed this pretty diamond data structure to describe the conversation. It gets relayed out, and yay, everybody's in sync again. So you can imagine that if Charlie went offline in the middle of it, the diamond would go and develop between these guys, and you'd have some totally separate world uh, developing out here as Charlie says hello, hello, hello to himself, wondering where everybody else went. And then when his network comes back again, you're going to effectively have a sidebar in the conversation that gets merged into the overall picture, and um, everybody will be consistent in the end. Likewise, the diamond will go back to him. Hello. So the discovery of the servers at the moment is by SRV records, very similar to SIP or XMPP. Uh, by default, we use port 8448 because it looks a bit like an identity matrix if you kind of squint hard enough. And um, honestly, it sucks because many people have lots of problems setting up SRV records. We're almost certainly going to change to using well-known URIs because if you don't have control over SRV, there's probably a higher chance that you'll be able to put a slash dot well-known URI JSON blob on your root of your, home, of your web server to tell people how, you can find, um, how they can find you. Uh, well-known URIs also let you describe more services than just um, I'm talking federation. Say that there was a gateway here hanging off charlie.com going to Charlie's IRC server, then I would be able to advertise that in my well-known URI. So right now, SRV in future, 
hopefully something better. Well, we, we just bootstrap off DNS. So, I mean, all we say is these guys need to publish themselves in DNS. You don't even need a record in DNS. If you're open on port 8448, and that happen, you have an A record to matrix.charlie.com already, that's good enough. So it's no, it's no more a bootstrapping problem than email or SIP or um, XMPP. It, it's, it's old school. It's not peer-to-peer -peer in the funky distributed hash tables and BitTorrent and kind of thing. It's more of a weird hybrid between a Git-style system and an old school mail system. The whole point of this data structure is to create logical timestamps. So um, every message here has pointers to the one which precede it from the perspective of the guy who sent it. So you can basically create a vector clock out of it by looking at the adjacency matrix of the um, graph and expressing it as logical timestamps. So you know the causality because th this arrow will always point to somebody in the past, and that's good enough. It's just like how Cassandra, or well no, it's not just like how Cassandra does it. It's like how React or one of the um, vector clock based um, eventually consistent databases do it. So meanwhile, back on the deck. Uh, come on. No, not search. Full screen. Um, here's another way of looking at the ecosystem. We've basically done this to death now. But the important thing is that you have the spec that defines, in this instance, the client-server API. Um, on the left-hand side, we've got um, three columns for the web world, iOS, and Android world. Lots of other clients from other people. On the bottom, we've got the servers between Synapse and Python, application services, and all of the other application services which are out there. The one interesting thing that's new here is to highlight that this is an app. This is reusable UI components. And this is just a simple wrapper of the HTTP API. So you can go in really at whatever level you're comfortable with. If you want to just talk the raw HTTP API, then get involved and do it. If you want to have a helper hand with an SDK that wraps it and handles some state, use that. If you want pretty chat UIs which you can reskin and brand and all the rest of it, use this. And if you want a whole app that you just want to fork and use for whatever purpose, then use the top here. The architecture, as again you've hopefully realized by now, looks a lot like this. Bunch of servers, bunch of clients. The interesting one are the application services, which are basically conceptually the same as clients, except they are God. They have super user powers, they are root. Um, these guys can do basically manipulate anything on that server that they're connected to. So if you wanted to subscribe to every event that the server can see because you're a search engine and you want to shove it into Elasticsearch and go and do some cool full text searching, then you would implement that there. If you want to subscribe to everything here and bridge it into IRC, then again, you do so there. So it's basically a client that can masquerade other clients and can masquerade rooms. I've just said that out loud. How does it work? We just looked at. Now, the actual API just posts some JSON to send an instant message. For WebRTC, it's a bit more complicated. You post the offer, as we saw earlier. The actual full VoIP flow, if you're interested, has typically got four events in it. You've got the mcall invite JSON that describes the offer. And then you have a bunch of candidates, which you trickle over as the ICE stack discovers new network um, ports. The user then answers it and sends back an mcall answer, which has the answer of the SDP in it. The media goes back and forth, and then eventually somebody hangs up. That much pretty similar to SIP, except each of these is just a simple HTTP hit rather than messing around with transactions and dialogues and branches and root headers and record root headers, unless you're on a SIP 2. Anyway, you get the idea. Client server API for persisting MIDI. Just to point out, this isn't just about comms and the conventional flavor. We built a MIDI gateway for a TechCrunch Disrupt Hackathon, uh, which was a lot of fun. And the way it worked was to negotiate network MIDI between a keyboard and a synthesizer. Um, and that would flow in real time, just like a VoIP call. But meanwhile, the gateway would also take all of the MIDI data and persist it like this, and this is the actual format of the JSON, into Matrix, so that a JavaScript app 
could go and view the MIDI events in real time and notate it um, with a Vector Graphics library and turn it into MIDI. So you have both the low latency jamming stuff going on and you have an almost real time view of the actual notation being played. It was a lot of fun. It almost worked had the Wi Fi on stage worked. Um, another thing you could do would be um, 3D avatars. So this was another TechCrunch um, hackathon. In fact, the one in September when we launched all of this back in September of last year. Um, because how can you have a project called Matrix and not have a kind of virtual world, some 3D avatar thing going on? So we went in to find some Unity 3D um, um, stickman kind of you know, 3D avatars, and you would use inverse kinematics to go and animate them on one client. You hit send, persists what you did to it um, as simple interactions in JSON, goes to the other end, they go and load up the same Unity scene, and they go and play the guy to do the same thing. Lots of fun. Actually worked relatively well. Um, if you're interested, go and look on YouTube for Matrix. Uh, 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 what do we call it? We called it the Animatrix, just to be original. Um, finally, uh, almost finally, in fact, the server-server API is um, a lot more complicated. I won't go through it in detail here, but suffice it to say we've got the signatures, we've got hashes of the contents, which allow us to redact the human-readable stuff. So if somebody puts something really offensive here, we do have a way to redact it by going and sending a kill message into the matrix, which vapes it. But the hash here, it means that we can retain the cryptographic integrity of the data structure. Because I should have mentioned on the diamond style data structure we were looking at earlier, each node includes a hash of the previous, uh, sorry, the signature here actually includes the signature of the previous nodes. So you have it cryptographically signed all the way back to the very first message in the room, a bit like the Bitcoin ledger or a Git um, uh, revision tree, if, depending on what you think of. Really, really cool because it stops people tampering with the rooms over the decentralized network. Um, application services, I've already said, are super user clients. You can use them for filtering, translation, indexing, mining, visualization, orchestration. Um, random app logic, or the most exciting one is gateways, like all of Freenode, as I mentioned earlier. Here is one. So this is just um, some simple Bython using the Flask um, uh, servlet or web, web container, whatever you call it, web API. And it's defining a single transaction endpoint, which um, the home server will be pushing all traffic to. So this is an instance where you basically bug your whole server, and you want to log everything that happens on it. And you run that configure the home server config to actually push to that URL, and you'll get the events of everything. Obviously, you only do this on your own server, and you are trusting it implicitly, but it's a very powerful thing. It looks like that, um, geometrically. The, the service is basically for a bridge. If you, this was on a SIP gateway or WhatsApp or whatever, and you've got clients hanging off it, then this guy is a protocol converted between Matrix and the rest of the world. Current progress is that we started this um, from scratch in May of last year, so a bit over a year ago now. Uh, we launched it at TechCrunch in September. Um, it was horrible at TechCrunch. It was barely working. Um, by December, we at least were feature complete. So in theory, most of the things, apart from end-to-end -end crypto, were there. We then went um, to a stable beta um, two months ago now, just. Uh, where it's really quite usable, and we're gearing up to make it a lot more glossy and performant um, for July. So what's next? Well, we've defined end-to-end -end encryption, and we need to actually roll it out. We're doing much better web UI components with React. Multi-way VoIP would be really cool, so that we have parity with Hangouts. Want to build as many application services as possible, but honestly, we don't have the resource on the core team to do this, so we're relying on the community, no pressure, to go and build application services to bridge into other ecosystems like hmm, SIP. Um, landing version 2 APIs, so we made some screw-ups on the version 1 API, version 2 helps a lot. Third-party IDs is something that I glossed over. Identity is a bit of an open question in Matrix right now. We've got these matrix IDs, which look a bit like email addresses, but we do not want people to use them in the wild. What we want is to use the existing MSI SDNs, phone numbers, email addresses, Facebook IDs, whatever it is that they already have in their address books, and map them through to matrix IDs. There's a whole separate two-hour conversation in how we can do that, and that's not what I'm going to talk about now. But if you're really interested, come and bug me later. I'm here all night. And making the spec suck less and have much better servers because the Python twisted server is great for hacking on and for prototyping, but it is not really production ready yet. 
So we need help. Please um, run your own servers. Our funding is linked directly to the number of servers and clients which are actually actively being used out there. So mm, we're basically being given a, a blank canvas to build this thing as long as we actually build it and people use it. Please run gateways through to IRC or XMPP or whatever, and if they don't exist, write them. Please tell us where it all sucks. Nothing is frozen yet. In practice, it hasn't really changed in the last 11 months, but it's still very much there to be fixed where needed until we go to 1.0. Um, if you're writing a new app, please don't invent your own signaling API. Please just consider using one that already exists like this, and feel free to follow us on Twitter and tell everybody how amazing we are. So that was what is Matrix, and I'm running horribly late, so in the next 10 minutes, I will give you a whistle-stop tour of the privacy and crypto side of things in Matrix. So hold on, everybody, and let's see what happens. Two different types of privacy. The obvious one is, can people see what you say? The other is metadata privacy. Can people say who you're talking to and when? So Matrix can protect the contents of what you're saying using end-to-end -end encryption. And in that scenario, neither the servers nor the network can decrypt the data, only the people you invite into those rooms. And the way we do this is using a library called Olm, which is today four days old, as you can sort of see, although actually that Olm is a bit older. And you can see it up there on GitHub. What is Olm? Olm is a Apache licensed um, C and C++ implementation of a cryptographic ratchet. A ratchet is basically a cryptographic um, technique which allows a bunch of people to generate a series of keys um, at the same time with minimal interaction between each other in terms of synchronization. So I can have on my client um, my copy of the room and I can keep generating the right keys to decrypt the messages coming in and whoever is sending them is also generating the same series of keys in order to generate that stream of messages. And you can only go forward through that chain of keys which is why it's called a ratchet because it keeps ratcheting forward. So what we did was to implement a spec um, described as Axolotl, written by Open Whisper Systems, um, who are a very cool bunch of guys um, in the States who defined this um, for their product called TechSecure. They then, I think, have licensed it to WhatsApp. So if you're using WhatsApp on Android and the government isn't bugging you, your end-to-end -end encryption will be using Axolotl. And it's also used in a bunch of other things like GNUnet and Pond, which are very, very um, privacy aware. So we did our own one in C and Apache because there weren't really any other ones. Um, sorry, Apache licensed C because there weren't any other ones. And the end result is that you get encrypted asynchronous group communication. So if you know what OTR is in an XMPP world, Axolotl is the next step beyond that in that it supports group conversation and you don't have to be on the s online at the same time. You can go and set it up in a you know, normal kind of message somebody. They may be there, they may not be there, it doesn't matter kind of way. And it's really small. Um, it um, comes in currently at about 100K of 64-bit Intel code, or 200K if you compile it down to JavaScript using mscripten. I have no idea why I say asm.js, because I don't think it is. But you use mscripten to transpile it from C++ to JavaScript, and it works really well. The architecture is that you get a C API, you've got a bunch of primitives below it, which I won't go into in great detail. Uh, let me just show you it quickly, because it isn't yet integrated entirely into Matrix, but... Um, there is a demo uh, lurking up here that the guy who wrote it has put together. And you can see that a JavaScript app just loaded in the background. This is the C++ code base running as transpiled JavaScript. And it's a very, very simple setup where you've got the top half of the screen being Alice's side of a conversation and the bottom half being Bob's. And if I go and put a message, say, hi, lean deuce, um, there, and hit encrypt as Alice, then it goes and produces a bunch of ciphertext I click on that and it copies it into the decryption box for Bob. Click decrypt on that and hey, it's amazing. It says, hi, Lean Deuce. You'll just have to believe me that I haven't copied the DOM from the top to the bottom, but it has gone through an enormous amount of JavaScript and C++ um, to make it work. And then for the other side of the ratchet, if I say, uh, uh, yeah, hi, then you get a much smaller message because this one contained the key exchange in the beginning, as I'll show you in a minute. Click on that, copies over to the description, decrypt there, and yay, it works. And it really does work. What we haven't finished is all the key management that hooks this thing into Matrix itself to actually go and allow Alice and Bob's private, um, sorry, key pairs to be properly negotiated. What does that mean? Well, um, here's a very, very hacky, rushed, kind of sort of description of Axolotl. Um, so both Alice and Bob generate a key pair, which is their identity. 
So this is just like a SSH key, key pair. You've got your private key and your public key. You publish your public key on your home server. So far, so good. The interesting thing is you also generate these ephemeral um, key pairs, which are per conversation. So each conversation ends up with its own um, key pair for both Alice and Bob. And in order to initialize the ratchet and get everybody on the same page so they can start decrypting the encrypting stuff in sync, you create this cool initial shared secret, which is a three-way Diffie-Hellman handshake between the various permutations of ephemeral and identity key that basically locks it to the very specific conversation between Alice and Bob that's about to happen. I won't bore you by trying to go through this, especially as I suspect it's all wrong. But basically, um, Alice ends up ha sending the public parts of the various keys of the conversation to Bob, as well as a ratchet key and the ciphertext and an index. And then later on, Bob responds um, by computing the same key from the same information, initializing his cipher, and um, it's all great. A better way, an easier way, in fact, of thinking of it is this diagram. Go away, annoying overlay which um, Open Whisper Systems put together. And it shows, basically, a series of um, ratchet keys being generated down the middle. And then you have, coming off here, new um, chain keys being generated here, here, and here. And each chain key generates a series of message keys. And the idea of this is that, basically, consecutive messages from Alice to Bob form a chain. And you just keep on ratcheting in that chain. And then when the conversation hands over to Bob's side, he will go and generate a new chain key and generate a new message chain, and they keep in sync like that. Apologies if anybody is a cryptographer and was very insulted by everything I just said, <laughs> and it's uh, uh, the best I can do in a few minutes, especially when I didn't write it. Um, that's the data flow diagram of what's actually going on here, that you take the initial shared secret and put it into an HMAC key derivation function on Alice's side, which generates the chain key and then the series of message keys coming out of it. Every time you want to create a new message key, you put it back into the uh, HMAC key derivation function, complete with some uh, a, a constant like that, and you basically keep iterating around, creating more um, message keys. And meanwhile, Bob is doing the same thing, having created his side of the ratchet there. Um, oh, and I've already shown you what it looks like. So you're probably thinking that's all very well for Alice and Bob, but didn't I say this was all great for group? Well, the way it works for group is that you add a third type of ratchet into the mix, which describes the contents of the room. So it's actually kind of simple. Um, everybody in the room just needs to do a one-to-one -one conversation to exchange the details of that ratchet. So you have a one-to-one -one between Alice and Bob and Alice and Charlie, Alice and Dave, Alice and Emma, et cetera, to go and exchange the information that is used in the ratchet for the main bit of the room. And then everybody is in sync on that. All the receivers share that ratchet to decrypt the room. So what does this mean for the end user? Obviously, all the crypto is great, but it's useless if nobody uses it. First of all, we allow people to have no ratchet. If you have got some crappy embedded device with an HTTP 1.0 stack, there is no way that you're going to be running a Axolotl implementation. We don't want to um, cut them out of the loop, and so they have the option of just not using it at all. Alternatively, you can have a full, perfectly forward secure ratchet where the main group map ratchet increments for every message in the room. Now, this is great for security because it means that uh, when you receive a message, you throw away the key for it, and only you and nobody will ever be able to decrypt it again. You got it, you got it once, and it's yours. It's terrible for a matrix user experience, though, because the whole point of matrix is um, server side history. So if you're doing PFS and you throw away the key, it basically means if you replay history, you're not going to be able to decrypt the conversation and stuff that was on the server. And imagine how crap that would be if it's on multiple devices and you just expect your phone to be in sync with your laptop or whatever. But no, because we downloaded it on the web browser, we can't download it on the laptop anymore. So what we've done instead is to invent this thing, or well, probably not invent it, but we're focusing on this thing called a selective ratchet, where we deliberately only advance the main group ratchet for the conversation when people want to. So when you invite somebody into the room and um, you don't want them to see what was happening before, you change the key. You ratchet it on, and when they come in, they're not going to be able to see the old key. Likewise, when you kick somebody or when somebody leaves, you might not want them to see what happens afterwards, so you change the key. If you finish your incredibly secret, um, nefarious conversation and you desperately want to change the key so it's sealed forever, you change the key. So it's not as good as PFS because basically folks will just cache those keys on their clients so they can scroll back through the whole thing. And if somebody owns their phone and gets those keys, they will also be able to scroll back through the whole thing. But in terms of the balance between 
um, privacy and some usability, it's probably quite good. Finally, we also do per message type ratchets. And this is really cool for an Internet of Things kind of use case. Imagine that I had my um, heartbeat and my blood pressure and my body temperature all stored in the same room by some device. I want to share my body temperature uh, with the air conditioning company, but I really don't want to be sharing my um, uh, blood pressure with them. Then if each message type gets its own ratchet, you can do the selective inviting thing where you can invite some vendors into the room um, to look at things for a period of time, and then you kick them out again. It's really empowering the user to control their data. So all of this is configured um, immutably on the room when you create it. So if I start a conversation and I say, hey, this is PFS forever, that was my call, and you're going to have to play with it. There's also a rogue faction in the team, um, which is actually mainly me, um, who's considering the idea that we should make everything axolotl on the server, and if you have a crappy client, you use a proxy to go and bridge between the crappy client and the main server, so everything is encrypted. But then again, for that to work properly, you probably end up with a selective ratchet with which never increments, at which point, why bother? I mean, who knows what will happen there? We're implementing it literally this week, so watch this space. So you might be thinking, this is all very well, but what about protecting metadata? They've gone and encrypted who was saying, uh, sorry, what was being said, but not who was talking to who and when. And this is a big deal, um, to say the least. Um, especially in the last couple of years, there is this terrible quote from um, the director of the NSA who said, we kill people based on metadata. And it's true. You go and drop drones on people based on if they're talking to the wrong people. There are all sorts of embarrassing examples, like the head of um, uh, Al Jazeera, who by metadata and analysis was labeled as a sort of ringleader of Al-Qaeda based purely on the fact that he kept speaking to Al-Qaeda sources. So metadata can be a big thing in certain circumstances. Matrix is all about fixing the vendor locking problem, as I said at the beginning. And there's a fundamental problem here, that you can't bridge into existing networks like IRC and Link and the PSTN without exposing who's talking to who. Because this puppy here has to, avoid, uh, has to leak the metadata of who's in the rooms so that it can be bridged in here and who's talking to who. So Matrix is basically, in its current form, fundamentally incompatible with protecting metadata. And that's just the way it is. But, oh, actually, it's not even but. It's worse than that, because meanwhile, all of these pretty diamond data structures and all the servers mean that even if the contents are encrypted, anybody participating in that room can look in the database and see, oh, well, I don't know what they were talking about, but these guys kept talking to each other at 5 o'clock in the morning every night for the last three weeks, which sounds a little bit suspicious. So can we do better? Yes. The hardcore crypto community has been doing some really cool stuff on this. Anybody use Pond? Anybody heard of Pond? Pond is really cool. So Pond is written by a guy um, whose name I'm going to completely forget. It's Adam Langley, whose day job is running Google's SSL infrastructure. He knows his stuff. He's a very smart chap from what I can tell. I don't know him. He's written this app called Pond. And what it does is to take Tor and define a bunch of servers which are hidden services within Tor. These should probably be within the cloud. And then your Pond client preserves sender privacy by only ever talking to the destination server and signing the message using this crazy hardcore crypto theory called group signatures. And group signatures are impossible to see who signed it unless um, you are basically the eventual recipient. So the server here can validate that the message came from somebody who was allowed to talk to the Alice here, but only Alice can decrypt it. So you, you actually protect who is talking to who in terms of identity. And there's also funky timing stuff here, which means that they deliberately delay the messages. So statistically, it's impossible to see whether a message arriving there was sent by there or there, because depending on the activity in the network, they delay things. Very cool. Shows that you can obscure metadata. Usably speaking, it has some big problems. You can only send about 100 messages a day over Pond because you have to delay things so much to avoid um, people seeing who's talking to who. Um, you obviously can't replay history here because it's all very, very perfectly secure stuff. So we did an interesting thought experiment because when we designed Matrix, obviously we wanted it to be extensible because it would be crap to create this thing, put all this effort into it. Some new tech like Pond comes along a couple of years later and we're utterly obsolete. So we want to evolve and support future architectures and privacy strategies. 
And a good Gedanken experiment could be how um, Matrix could adopt a pond light strategy. So in practice, this would mean, mean moving the home servers onto the client because the home servers have all the metadata. You've got that data structure that shows precisely who's talking to who and when. Meanwhile, you could do a hybrid approach with Pond by putting hidden servers inside something like Tor or I2P or GNUnet or whatever it might be, some kind of overlay service to go and um, do storm forward for those encrypted messages. And then you do an incremental migration. So just as we're going to do an incremental migration from plain text to end-to-end -to -end encryption, this allows us to incrementally migrate from the old school matrix DAG stuff over HTTPS to some crazy Tor thing in the future, possibly. So what would it look like? Well, it's almost a precise hybrid between the two. You've got Tor with these pond-style hidden services using, uh, providing a transport. And meanwhile, the server itself has been moved onto the device. So it's a lot more of a pure peer-to-peer -peer architecture. But it has some really, really, really cool advantages um, over the pure pond technique, which is that we haven't changed the matrix client-server API. So all of those 15, 16 clients I showed you earlier, including the glossy ones around the corner, are still going to work fine with the server side of things. So from the user experience perspective, nothing has changed from the user's perspective. It just happens to be that the app has got a server embedded in it, and it's doing all this crazy crypto stuff. We can still do replayable decentralized conversation history, complete with the axolotl stuff by tunneling um, the existing stuff over the pond transport. And even we can go and continue to bridge into um, other systems. So I mean, if we go and run this guy on a server, it can still be a bridge into XMPP or whatever. It obviously totally eliminates all of the benefits of the metadata privacy because we will still be exposing it there, but at least we still have the option of doing that if, for legacy reasons, we want to bridge this room into Freenode or whatever it might happen to be. So this is vaporware. It doesn't exist. probably doesn't make sense, but it's an interesting thought experiment to see how one could evolve matrix um, in future to be a proper metadata-preserving um, communications network. But honestly, it's not our focus today. People like Pond and GNUnet are doing a much better job of it. And in, we're actually talking a lot to GNUnet in, at the moment, and perhaps in future, um, there will be a way in which the two can play nice to it uh, with one another and come up with something like this. But right now, we're focused on getting 1.0 of Matrix itself out the door. And I've run four minutes late, and that was the last slide. So thank you very much.